Our speaker today is uh, Major General U.S. Army retired Robert Shadley. Um, he is also the author of a book, The Game Unraveling a Military Sex Scandal. During his leadership career, he guided more than 3,500 military men and women in combat and over 20,000 students in training. He retired from active duty in 2000 following a distinguished 33-year military career that included advisor to the Vietnamese Ordnance Corps in Vietnam, commander of the 801st Maintenance Battalion in the 101st Airborne Division, commander of the Division Support Command in the 1st Infantry Division mechanized during operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm, director of logistics for the United States Atlantic Command during Operation Uphold Democracy in Haiti, chief of ordnance and commanding general of the U.S. Army Ordnance Center and Schools, director of logistics, U.S. Army Forces Command. Major General Shadley served in key leadership positions at Alliant Tech Systems, including Senior Vice President Force Protection, Advanced Weapons Division. He also has served as a senior mentor providing logistics and leadership subject matter expertise to the U.S. Army Combined Arms Support Command and the U.S. Army Battle Command Training Program. Major General Shadley currently provides acquisition and logistics advice to businesses in the defense sector. He has been awarded the Distinguished Service Medal, the Defense Superior Service Medal, the Legion of Merit with two oak leaf clusters, the Bronze Star with oak leaf cluster, the Meritorious Service Medal with four oak leaf clusters, the Army Commendation Medal, the Army Achievement Medal, and the Alabama Distinguished Service Medal. Major General uh, Shadley received his bachelor's and master's degree in industrial engineering from Purdue University, and he holds a master's of military art and science degree from the United States Army Command and General Staff College. He's also a graduate of the British Royal Armor School and the U.S. Army War College. One of Major General Shadley's most heroic acts of his military career was exposing the military sex game at the U.S. Army Ordnance Center and school at Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland, where he served as its commanding general. As a result, the game was also found at multiple locations in the military. I give you our most honored guest today, Major General Bob Shadley. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. Uh, my mom spent a lot of time working on that. So, uh, The first question I usually get is, why would anyone spend 33 years on active duty in the military? Well, this is, this is a true story. I'm a young captain, uh, been in the Army five years, and my assignment officer says, we need to get you some high-level staff visibility, so we're going to send you to a major headquarters in Washington, D.C. I'm there a little, a little bit of time, and my boss, a, a, a colonel, and I'm, I'm a captain, and the colonel calls me in and says, the general would like to have you head this year's combined federal campaign. That's the military or government's version of the United Way. And he said, no, Bobby, this is a big deal. This is how the general judges young officers, how well they organize and get results. So don't screw it up. It's, a, it's pretty important. So the second day of my campaign, the crusty old colonel that was the general's deputy called me up and says, Bob, I got a problem with your combined federal campaign. I see my whole career going down the tubes over this thing. And I said, well, sir, what's the problem? He said, well, the envelopes you gave us are too small for the checks. And he gave a little brown envelopes like you used to get. And I said, well, sir, most of the folks have been folding the checks over in half and sliding them right in there. It seems to work pretty well. He says, oh, that's a great idea. Thanks a lot, and hung up. I knew at that moment I could make at least colonel in the Army. <laughs> um, one of the challenges that you all are going to have today is that when you get selected for general in the Army, they send you off to something called leadership at the summit, and I went to the Center for Creative Leadership in Colorado Springs, F a five-day course, uh, Monday through Thursday, uh, only 25 in the class, only one military, and then on Friday morning, 
you get to spend four hours with your psychiatrist who has been monitoring you through the four days. And, um, and so I went and sit down Friday morning with my psychiatrist, and she says, oh, you're going to be a general. And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, we've never had a future general with a psychological profile like yours. And I said, what does that mean? And she says, we think you should consider a career change. <laughs> I've only been in the Army 26 years by then. I said, well, what do you think I should be? And she said, we think you should be a school teacher. And I was too dumb to say, I've, you know, at the time I should have said, well, that's what we do in leadership position. We teach young folks. To do so I said, and she said, what do you think about that? And I said, I don't know. What do you think I should think? You're the expert. And it kind of went downhill from there. So I, 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 guess, I guess I have a little of this teaching thing in me. And I tend to get in the lecture mode, so please bear with me. I would like to save time at the end for some questions. Um, the subject is leadership in a crisis. Um, my definition of leadership is built upon a definition of management that I read in a, in a textbook when I was at Purdue years ago. The author of the textbook was Kuntz, K-O-O-N-T-Z. And he said, management is the art of getting things done through others. Management is the art of getting things done through others. After a little bit of time in the military, I said, well, really, leadership is the art of getting things done through others when the others don't think they can do it, don't want to do it, and or it's inherently dangerous to do so. And so that's, a, you know, you can manage a safe way. Or you can, manage, you can manage a professional baseball team. You can get the right players in the right position, but it takes a leader to, to bring that team to, to a championship status. Okay, for a technology, technologically impaired guy, here we go. <laughs> um, the crisis that I'd like to talk about today happened when I was the commanding general, as uh, John mentioned, of the Ordnance Centers and Schools at uh, Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland. We were, in essence, a technical college. If you came into the Army in 1996 or before, you went to eight weeks of basic training where you were taught how to salute, fire your weapon, make your bed, basic soldier skills. And then you would go off into something called advanced individual training where you'd learn to be a, a vehicle driver, an artillery person, a, a maintenance, which we taught. And so I, w I ran basically a technical college and we trained 20 to 25,000 students a year at 11 different schoolhouses around the country. And, and we taught 87 different courses of instruction. So I'm, I'm sort of aware of the challenges that you have with uh, young folks uh, in, in, uh, in, in, a, in a university uh, setting. The, the challenge that that we came across was a group of drill sergeants, the guys in the Smokey the Bear hats, who were using their positions of power to see how many young female trainees they could sleep with. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now, this was in, again, 1995, 96, 97 time frame. But some of it's still relevant today as we read in the papers. And it's not just the Army. It's, it's all services. It's not just the military either. It's in, in, uh, in uh, religious organizations. It's in business. Uh, it's in colleges and universities. And it's, the, it's a, a basic abuse of power and disrespect for other individuals. And we'll talk more about that later. Now, the latest numbers from the Department of Defense is that there are 26,000 victims of sexual assaults in the military each year. Uh, my experience is very seldom do you have one perpetrator, one victim. You have one perpetrator, multiple victims. Best case, still a worst case, is you have one perpetrator, two, two victims. So that's 13,000 sexual, uh, uh, sexual predators in the military. How many people are in the military? 1.3 million, that's 1%. That 1% is causing all this trauma 
and, and, and tragedy to the individual victims. I stopped counting when I was at Aberdeen when I passed 5,000 pages of sworn statements from victims and perpetrators. And the last couple of years I've been going around talking about this subject to multiple audiences and, 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 and have shared uh, many long sessions, uh, very traumatic sessions with, with young women uh, who have been victimized. Now I should point out that of the, of the 26,000 victims of sexual assaults in the military today, 53% of those are men. 53% of the victims in the military are men. 40% of those are assaulted by women. So it cuts across uh, uh, all sectors of our, our society. Part of our challenge and why I think we still have the challenge today is that a report put out by the American Medical Association in 1996 reported on a study done of 11 to 14 year old boys. A study of 11 to 14 year old boys and girls. 51% of boys and girls said forced sex was acceptable if the boy spent a lot of money on the girl. 31% of boys and 32% of, of girls said it was acceptable for a man to rape a woman with past sexual experience. 87% of boys and 79% of girls said sexual assault was acceptable if the man and woman were married. 65% of boys and 47% of girls said it was acceptable for a boy to rape a girl if they had been dating for more than six months. So those 18 years ago, those are now your 29 to 33 year olds who are in, in middle management, not only in the military, but other organizations. So a lot of this uh, challenge we face today is basic uh, society uh, and, and our culture that we have accepted lower standards of ethical and moral behavior. Um, we say in the military, uh, we are not going to accept the fact that we take America's sons and daughters in and we have to accept their standards of conduct. The military today is working very, very hard to change the culture and to change the way people think about other people and how they act. That's the big difference from the time 1996 to today. Uh, the senior leadership of the nation and of the military are now saying we've got a problem and we'll talk a little bit more later. In my era, it was, we need, we need to make the problem go away. We don't need to solve the problem. We need to protect the brand. We have improved uh, access to legal and medical care for victims. Uh, we have uh, in, improved the judicial system, and we're making progress, but we've still got a long way to go. Uh, a couple uh, weeks ago, I was at a military installation, a young, uh, Sergeant First Class uh, E7 asked to talk to me after a presentation and after about an hour of talking about how she had been raped in Afghanistan by an Afghan soldier and, and no one really seemed to care about her, um, she said to me, you know, sir, I think God sent you to me today because now I know someone cares about me. And I said, you know, I said to myself, wow, I'm making a difference. I'm doing some good. And then I got back to the hotel and I looked in the mirror and I said, why can't she say that about her current leadership? Why did some old retired guy have to fly 1,200 miles to make a non-commissioned officer in the United States Army feel important? My wife and I are working with an Air Force, uh, former uh, uh, Air Force Academy uh, graduate who was raped at the Air Force Academy several times in 1981, and she just last year was able to tell her parents about it. Blamed herself. The trauma, and the, and the danger uh, for future uh, life that the, the perpetrators of the, these uh, crimes uh, uh, impart on their victims is life-changing, uh, life-altering, and a, uh, and a, and a uh, terrible tragedy on those victims. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what I've been doing to uh, help eradicate the cancer of sexual assaults from not only our military, but other um, organizations. 
And to do that, I like to go through what, what we uncovered at Aberdeen. Uh, we started out, we did a command climate assessment, what anyone would do when you go into a new job. You talk to people, you find out what's behind each closed door and all that stuff. And things look pretty good. We did have a problem with not enough resources, but you always have that challenge. Not enough people, material, time, and money. After about four months, we noticed an increase on student-on-student -student misconduct. That's where young men and women, our, our trainees were between 18 and 22 years old. Young men and women. And the young folks, when they had the weekends off, would go downtown, rent a room, buy a bunch of alcohol, party, invariably someone would end up in bed with someone which, which was not consensual. So we worked that hard, Chief. We, said, we went to the local uh, uh, police department there in Aberdeen, Maryland, and said, hey, we need to do more random traffic stops. We need to, we need to make sure that all the, the uh, liquor selling establishments card their people. Uh, we need to make sure that young people have a friend with them so they're not isolated. And so we drove that to just about nothing. And then our soldiers surfaced this uh, misconduct by drill sergeants or instructors. Now here's the scene. You've got 18 to 20 year old young women. In my case, it was only men on women. You had 18 year old single young women and 35 to 40 year old drill sergeants instructors. Then these guys um, is, is really an abuse of power. And you see this not only in the military, but in other organizations where you have a hierarchical structure. And then you put people who have the propensity to abuse positions of power in positions of power. It's like throwing gasoline onto a fire. And so we discovered something called GAM, G-A-M, or Game a la Military. And it uh, was based on something called playing the game and the instructors, these married drill sergeants and other instructors at our schoolhouse, were seeing how many young women they could sleep with. Then you had to, to get in the game for a man, you had to be relatively good looking. You had to know how to talk appropriately to, to the young women. You couldn't ask them for sex. You had to maneuver around the little code words that people used. And you had to agree not to hit on another drill sergeant's woman. And, and, and so they had regular... Uh, regular rules that they follow. Well, we uncovered this over time. It's just like pulling on a ravel on a sweater. The more we pulled, the worse it got. We started out with one person, and then we found two persons. At that time, I had the decision as the commanding general, say, okay, we've got a problem. Let's not do any more investigations. Let's just work the problem. And as a result of talking with my wife, and I document all this in the book, she got me uh, and, uh, to make sure that we had three objectives. First was to take care of the young women who were victimized. And so in any crisis, the first thing you have to do is take care of the victims. I, uh, I sent a copy of my book to Archbishop Ninstead back in April, and I sent him a note this morning on my way over here. Ho hopefully, sir, I had something to do with the decision to make the victims number one priority. So we'll see what he says. But that's the first thing you have to do is take care of the victims. Don't worry about yourself. Don't worry about your organization. Take care of victims. The second thing we did said, okay, our number two priority is we will go out. The first priority was to identify, take care of the victims. To do that, we had to identify them. So we went out and had trained investigators interview over 900 young women who had gone through our school for a two-year period. Trained criminal investigators. And uh, from them, in their statements, we found out who the perpetrators were. And so we turned their names over to the legal system to allow that to work. And then our, my priority then, in addition to taking care of the victims, was to take corrective action so this wouldn't happen again in the future. We kept our higher headquarters informed, uh, which was good news and bad news. Uh, one thing I learned in the Army, particularly most of your Army bases are in the South, so you learned... Uh, very quickly, the difference between help and hep. Help is what you want. Hep's what you get. So we got a lot of hep from a lot of people. This became a national media topic. 
And uh, my fir first uh, interview on national television was with, with Bryant Gumbel. And I'm, I'm sitting there looking at camera. I can hear him. I'd never done this before. And he says, uh, it was very congenial conversation. And the last question was, well, General, I've just got one final question for you. And I said, yes, Brian. He said, how could anybody be so incompetent as to allow this to happen on their watch? And I had, my training in dealing with the media was a half hour discussion at midnight the night before in Washington with some public affairs folks. And the guidance was, answer the question you wish they had asked, not the, answer, the question they asked. So I said, well, Brian, as I said, we have three objectives here. And I went through him. He said, well, I'm, you're not answering my question. What are you, you know, how could you be so incompetent? So I gave him the three objectives again. And so then he went on, so I gave him to him again. He said, well, obviously you're not going to answer my question. I said, well, have a nice day, Brian. He said, have a nice day, Brian. So we left. <laughs> so, um, so then the, some national agenda uh, overshadowed our objectives of taking care of victims, identifying perpetrators, uh, taking care of them through the legal system. And, uh, of the 12 drill sergeants and instructors that we court-martialed, all were African-American. Uh, the victims mirrored the ethnicity profile of the Army almost exactly, 68% Caucasian, uh, about 18% uh, 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 African-American, and 13% or whatever the numbers are. Uh, were uh, Hispanic or other. And so the natural, the natural uh, allegation uh, from some people was we, we were prejudiced and we were targeting African Americans. This is a complex subject that I can't not talk about in less than an hour or so. But suffice it to say, uh, being an engineer, I could not prove that we were not racist by using numbers. Uh, and, and the bottom line is, we have to be very sensitive of a nation, uh, as a nation, to the challenges that some of our society has faced in the past and understand that there are a lot of things uh, in this world that not only African Americans in this country, but also uh, folks of different religious persuasions and uh, where they're from have had to confront in the past in a way of prejudice and bias. And so we just have to be sensitive to that. The second issue that came up was the role of women in the military. We had women who didn't want women in combat, women who wanted women in combat. Men who didn't want women in combat, men who wanted women in combat. Men, women who wanted women trained with men, women who didn't want women trained with men. men on any given day, our problem uh, that we were facing at Aberdeen fed on, any, on many political agenda. Um, then Congress got involved and uh, said, well, we need to hold somebody accountable. And I remember uh, Olympia Snow came, and her, her staff's final question to me was, who's responsible for this mess? And I said, well, Senator, that's the easiest question you all last, ask all day. I'm responsible. I'm the commanding general. I'm responsible for everything that happens and fails to happen. What happened is we had some bad people doing some bad things, and we found out about it, and we're taking corrective action. Now, what didn't happen is we didn't find out about it soon enough, Mr. Childress, my civilian deputy, explained why. And that was uh, right after the, this was right after the first Gulf War. We were taking the peace dividend. We did away with chaplains in our units. We did away with equal opportunity officers. We did away with executive officers. So the young women who were victimized by these uh, drill sergeants and the other instructors they were the first person in this young woman's chain of command. And we, and we train young soldiers in basic, you follow the chain of command. If you've got a problem, you go to your boss. And they were, well, what happens when the first link in the chain of command is rotten and there are no escape valves? Uh, the women felt trapped. I was walking through one of the training departments right after I took command. And this one young woman's eyes followed me everywhere I went. So I went over and read, read her name tag, and I said, where are you from? Or what's your first name? She said, Heather. And I said, where are you from, Heather? And she said, Circleville. And I said, Circleville where? And she said, Circleville, Ohio. And I said, I am too. And she said, I know, and you're the chief of ordinance. Now, usually when a two-star general is talking to a private, it's ba 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 So, and she's, you know, and I said, how'd you know that? She said, because my aunt is in your mom's bridge club, 
and she sent me a copy of the Circleville Herald with your picture in it. So I had a picture taken with sweet young Heather, and I wrote on it, Heather, best of luck in your military career, Bob. Well, what did sweet young Heather do? She took this photo that I had autographed to her, to her chain of command, and said she needed to have every weekend off so she could go back to Ohio with her friend Bob. Okay? <laughs> so, so the investigators are coming over to my house to see if I had any young women chained up in the base. It was, you know. <laughs> um, but the point of that is young people make mistakes. Um, and senior leaders need to show them the right way and not take advantage of their failings. Um, when, when the trial was over and she came back and, uh, to testify, she came into my office with her uncle to apologize for using my, uh, my picture to get uh, off on the weekends. And I said, Heather, why didn't you come and see me? Or have your mom call my mom? Because my mom would have kicked my rear end if I, if, if, if I didn't know this stuff was going on. And she said, and I quote, oh, sir, you won't believe the hold that Drill Sergeant Simpson had over all of us. It was, so we, we uh, tried and convicted several folks, uh, perpetrators, on the concept of constructive force, where we said as a mere, as a mere fact of, that someone had almost complete control based on their leadership position, that's just like you had a knife holding it to the young woman's. Then the final uh, national agenda that came into play and really uh, caused a lot of problem is that the, the folks in Washington, primary objective became, let's protect the, the brand, let's protect the institution. We can't have the army appear or the military appear to be a bad place, unsafe place for women. Because our army and our military cannot function today without women. It's just, it's just impossible, so we've got to solve this problem. Now, um, what we did, uh, and this will be my last chart uh, until I show a picture, uh, we set about to make number one priority to taking care of our, our, uh, our uh, victims. We formed a crisis action team. We had to get the right people. Uh, don't worry about the rank or position, just get the right people. I'm getting ready to brief the uh, 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 NAACP one night. I go around my staff and um, I say, okay guys, gals, what do you think? Oh, sir, you're right on. You're going to prove our point right on. So I came to Colonel Mary Jo Clark and I said, Mary Jo, what do you think? And she said, sir, you're coming across as a racist. And I said, what do you mean? I'm not a racist. She says, I know you're not, but that's what my black ears heard you say. And so I use that story over and over. Not everyone hears what you think you're saying the same way. Women in the room are hearing things differently than the men are, from what I'm saying. Everyone is hearing things a little bit differently. So we gotta be sensitive to that. We need to identify the potential victims. We do know that young women from small towns in the Midwest uh, annual family income of $36,000 or less are more susceptible uh, than other than uh, young women from big cities who know how to handle the situations. Uh, we need to identify the perpetrators. We need to treat the perpetrators in the military like we did uh, druggies, uh, zero tolerance uh, out, of, out of the military via the court system. Uh, we need to be aggressive and consistent at all levels and recognize this is never ending. Just like your organizations that you work in, it's different every day. You have different people coming in and leaving. Okay, this is the book, uh, cheap publicity ad, they're available. Uh, if you'd like to talk about what it's like to self-publish a book, it is a non-profit organization, even though they don't start out that way. Uh, on the right, uh, Chief knows I, I go around and I, I give an hour and a half talk on leadership in a crisis in much more detail than this. To show how the Army has changed, uh, this is the Chief of Staff of the Army, the top uh, soldier in our Army's uh, professional reading list. You notice uh, my book is down at the bottom. I'm honored to be on the same page as, as uh, Edgar Purrier, who I had the pleasure of meeting in 1972 after he had talked with President Eisenhower about uh, his time in the Army. Questions, comments?
General, one quick question. I know you're running out of time here. Uh, I've had the privilege of hearing the presentation, so I kind of know the answer to this, but for the group, you went into this situation as a two-star general, and I think maybe even aspiring to be a three- or four-star general. What did you, uh, what did this case cost you in terms of a career? And you did that knowing it would cost you that. Oh, uh, yeah, we, I, uh, Chief, three, for all of you, three weeks into this, I came to the conclusion that I personally was going to take one for the team. Um, and, and I was always raised, if you do the right thing, the good Lord will take care of it. And so just d do right. And uh, I got the staff together and I said, hey, gang, I think I'm going to go down over all this. I love you all to death. I appreciate what you've been doing for me the last six months. If any of you want to leave, I'll get you a good job. I'll give you a great efficiency report. And it will not hurt your career one bit. But if you stay here, I think we're all, we all could get in trouble. And uh, none of them left. And I'm still friends with them to this day. So uh, I knew that my, that my career was over. And so uh, I had, uh, in fact, a year ago after the uh, uh, Masters tournament, a friend of mine, retired three-star general, called up and said, Bob, I started reading your book last night after the Masters. I couldn't put it down to finish this morning. I just want you to know that, that we all had, uh, you planned to be a four-star command of the Army Material Command, and sorry it didn't work out. And I said, you know, you never know if that's going to happen or not. You know, you can get run over by a truck. I think uh, people in leadership positions, uh, you got to like what you do and not worry. You know, you can't worry about yourself or what's going to happen to you because the, the greatest uh, uh, enemy that we have in each of us, Pastor, is your ego. That ego blocks off the things up in your mind or your heart that, uh, that uh, enables you to think I can do anything I want to, uh, the Bathsheba effect, and, uh, and it's really not. You just got to do the right thing. So I, I'm very happy. I came up here. I live in Minnesota. Been here 14 years. Stay frozen half the year. You only age half as fast, so I've only put on seven years. My, <laughs> wife, my wife is happy. Um, and I tell you, she's a big part of the book. The only mistakes that I've made uh, in my life for the 36 years we've been married is when I haven't listened to her. And uh, she has a great uh, understanding of people. Uh, she's my personal hero. She was one of 10 survivors of a four-engine jet crash when she was a flight attendant. Uh, 72 died, 10 survived. And so she knows what it's like to work under pressure. And uh, she's the one who said, you got to take care of the victims, your number one priority. Okay. Any other? Are you here for a few I, I'm here. I, you know, again, if you'd like to have a book, they're available. Thank you. So, thank you.